Welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients, Traveling Safely During COVID-19. Thank you for joining us today for an educational webinar regarding traveling safe, safely during COVID-19. If you have been tuning into our webinars over the last few years, you have had access to information from AAKP's trusted federal partner, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. AAKP is proud to have the CDC as one of our long-term federal strategic partners, and AAKP is honored to serve as an ex officio member of the CDC Health Infection Control Practices Advisory Panel. My name is Erin Kale, and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics, and Advocacy. I oversee our patient research and education activities, as well as our grassroots engagement activities, such as our ambassador initiative, which falls under our Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives. And we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies such as the coronavirus pandemic. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic, and private sector research, shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities that you receive via email. I'd like to introduce Paul Conway, AAKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, who will go over some patient insights gleaned from a recent flash survey AAKP deployed about traveling during COVID-19. Paul, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Erin, and thanks to all you who are joining us today. Well, it's the third year and we're still dealing with COVID. So many of you have had questions about how to travel safely during this holiday season and how safely to approach family and friends and discussions about your travel. And so what we've done is we've pulled together some different data points to give you context before our speaker today. On the first slide, we asked patients how many had family members or those in their close circle of friends who had been infected by COVID-19. And as you can see here, 83% of those who responded had somebody that was a friend or a member of their family who had experienced the COVID-19 virus over the past several years. On this next slide, we were able to capture data from our survey that actually demonstrated that general sense that patients have that society is moving on and is less concerned about those who are immunocompromised and immunosuppressed. And as you can see, across many different sectors of society, patients feel quite strongly that their interests are no longer being fully represented and that the rest of society has moved on from their concerns. In this next slide, we show what patients are doing to take charge of their own lives and to protect themselves as public vigilance seems to wane. And as you can see, 84% of patients are saying they're looking out for themselves and taking responsibility for their futures. So in this next slide, we show how patients are taking it upon themselves to use risk mitigation strategies and tactics to keep themselves safe as the public concerns about COVID seem to wane. Right off the top, 84% of patients are getting their vaccinations. 81% are using masks, 76% are using hand washing, 70% are using hand sanitizer, and most interestingly, over half of patients are still using online shopping to avoid crowds. 65% are engaged in fewer social activities, and 53% have reduced or stopped recreational travel. In the next slide, we ask this question, that compared to previous holiday seasons, what are folks gonna be doing? And you can see that only about 19% plan to travel more, 31% plan to travel less, and 40% will travel just about the same, which is far reduced than in prior years prior to COVID. 10% are still not certain. In the next slide, we wanted to gauge people's interests and show 
how patients are very well equipped and knowledgeable consumers of information in healthcare who can manage their risk. So as COVID-19 variants increase, and as news coverage about those brings these concerns to the forefront, you can see that 80% are planning on reducing recreational travel, 59% are planning on reducing in-store shopping, and 75% will cur curtail their social activities, including holiday parties and holiday events. In this next slide, we're showing you information that was released in October of 2022 by the United States Renal Data System. And we have the source down here at the bottom. We would encourage you to go on and take a look at it. But this is important information for context on why AAKP has worked so hard to educate patients on the risks of COVID-19 because our recent history with this virus makes it very clear that it poses serious risks to kidney patients. As you can see here, during the period of January 2020 to June of 2021, 10% of patients with CKD, 13% of patients with a kidney transplant, and 20% of patients on dialysis were diagnosed with COVID-19. And those rates are very high when you think of it comparatively to Medicare beneficiaries that did not have CKD, as you can see from the yellow highlight. On the next point, COVID-19 hospitalizations were more than double those among patients with CKD compared to those without CKD. In this next slide, you have some of the starkest information to date that's available about the impact of COVID on the kidney patient population, and that's in regard to mortality. So mortality at 14, 30, and 90 days after a COVID diagnosis was more than twice as high among patients with CKD as among those without CKD. But the details in here really do matter. Nearly 25% of patients with CKD and COVID-19 died within 90 days. And the 90-day mortality rate was 40.5% for patients on dialysis and 44.1% for those with a kidney transplant. Think about those numbers. Again, this is one of the reasons why AAKP and so many other organizations that we work with has spent so much time and invested so much energy into educating patients and family members like you who are listening today on the need to maintain caution and maintain defense against this virus. There was also an unprecedented reduction in the prevalence of CKD and ESRD among Medicare beneficiaries in 2020. And the only reason for that was the high mortality rate in this population. And on a last note, higher COVID-19 mortality among black patients resulted in a narrowing of the black-white mortality difference that had been seen for decades among patients on dialysis and a reversal among those with stage four and five CKD with a kidney transplant. And so what does all this mean? Well, as kidney patients, it means that we must remain vigilant. And it also means that as you plan out for the holidays and think about what you may wanna do, that you have a tremendous responsibility to yourself and to your family and to your community to get the best information you can and to be smart about what you're doing, understand the risks and understand all the options that you have available to you to prevent infection and to stay safe because a lot rides on you as a patient. You have your family, you have your fellow workers and you have society to think about. And we all know that patients are intelligent consumers of information and we can figure things out but sometimes we need some experts to help us along the way. And that goes to our expert today. Aaron, let me go ahead and throw it back over to you so we can begin our program. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser. Dr. Nemhauser is a captain in the U.S. Public Health Service and a senior medical officer in the Travelers Health Branch of the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of CDC Health Information for International Travel, nicknamed the Yellow Book. Dr. Nemhauser received his medical degree from Hanneman University School of Medicine in Philadelphia and is board certified in emergency medicine. We are so pleased to have him here today to share important information about maintaining safe travel during COVID-19. Dr. Nemhauser, I turn things over to you. Hi, and good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. My name is Captain Jeffrey Nemhauser, and I am a medical officer 
in the Travelers Health Branch with the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm pleased to join you today for a overview and discussion of COVID-19 and international travel and update. So I'm going to start today with an introduction of the topic of COVID-19 and international travel, and then we'll move into some more details from there. We know that older adults and people with the conditions that I have listed on the next slide are more likely to get very sick from COVID-19. And by very sick, CDC means that they will require hospitalization, perhaps intensive care, so being admitted to an ICU or intensive care unit, they, will, are, they are more likely to require mechanical ventilation or be hooked up to a respirator machine to do the breathing for them. And they are more likely to die uh, if infected with COVID-19. We know that over 80% of COVID-19 deaths occur in people over 65. And you can see from this fairly long list, who are the people most at risk from severe disease associated with COVID-19. And it ranges, and these are presented in alphabetical order, not necessarily in the order of seriousness, but they range from cancer, uh, you can see down the list to HIV infection, and then starting at the top of the second list, people who are immunocompromised, whether that's because of an underlying health condition or perhaps because they are being given medications by their healthcare provider to control uh, or manage a medical condition, all the way down to tuberculosis. And you can see I have highlighted there, and of course the reason why I'm speaking with you all today, uh, two of the chronic conditions or serious conditions that can result in severe COVID-19 illness are people with chronic kidney disease and people who have undergone solid organ Cell, uh, solid organ transplants, including people who have received kidney transplants. Um, and I'm imagining that there are people in the audience today who fall into that category. Now we know that the weekly, weekly COVID-19 deaths in the United States have gone down over time. And you can see all the way to the far right of this slide, we are now at a level uh, most recently of 2,834 deaths due to COVID-19 uh, pretty much at the end of August of 2022. And this compares obviously favorably, you can see the peaks there, um, the early part of, of 2022, um, 18,000, almost 19,000 deaths in a week uh, prior to that in uh, December or January of 2021. Uh, December of 20 and January 21, up to 23,500 deaths. And before that, um, at the very beginning, the very earliest date of the pandemic, uh, about 15,600 deaths. So we have come down quite significantly, but 2,834 deaths in a week due to COVID is still a very large number. And we are waiting to see what happens uh, as we move into the peak season that we've seen in the last two years. And so we really want all people, in particular, uh, those who are at most uh, risk for serious disease, um, the, those categories that I showed on the previous slide, but we really want all people to make sure that they take adequate precautions against COVID-19 um, so that we can work uh, in public health and with healthcare providers to make sure that the weekly COVID deaths go down even further. So the first thing that you can do, or one of the things that you can do in order to help address that, perhaps one of the most important things you can do, um, is to get your COVID-19 vaccine. So we know that the COVID-19 vaccines are very effective at helping to protect people from getting seriously ill from COVID-19, uh, from being hospitalized, and also from dying. So it's important, especially for people who are at increased risk for severe disease, as we had talked about, but really all people 
uh, need to be up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines. In addition, getting uh, the booster shots, the recommended booster shots, um, can help restore protection. So we know that as time passes between the time that you have gotten your last shot or even maybe the time that you had been infected previously uh, with COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, that your immune response will decrease. And by getting boosters, you can help to restore your protection from future infection. We also know that there are new vaccines, and specifically the vaccines that target BA4 and BA5 variants of COVID-19 virus, that the boosters can do a couple of things. One is that they can help to restore protection after your last vaccination or perhaps even your in, uh, previous infection with the COVID-19. And they also can provide targeted protection against some of the newer variants. Uh, an example of that would be the new booster that is available and recommended by the CDC um, that specifically uh, protects against the BA4 and BA5 variants of the COVID-19 virus. We want people to stay up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines. And we've defined up to date to mean the completed primary series, and we'll go into some details about that in the next couple of slides, but also the most recent CDC recommended booster dose. And that's what, how CDC defines being up to date with COVID-19 vaccines. Now, the vaccine recommendations that CDC makes for people is based on uh, several different factors. One is the age, your age, when you uh, get your vaccine, you first get your vaccine. Um, it also depends on what the vaccine was that you first received, how long it's been since your last dose. As we said, there may be, there, time may have elapsed since your last dose um, or since your last infection. We wanna make sure that um, you get adequately adequate protection since that time. Um, and also your immune status. As we talked about in the earlier slide, we know that people who are immunocompromised um, are at increased risk for severe disease. And those people may have, um, or those people do have different recommendations um, if they are moderately or severely immunocompromised. And that includes people who are organ transplant recipients who are on immunosuppressive drugs to prevent their bodies from rejecting the organs that they have received. So over the next three slides, um, I've put together some tables to help you make sense of the COVID-19 vaccines. And this same information, there are tables that are on the CDC website. There are some infographics on the CDC website. Um, it's a little bit technical, a little bit complicated. I've tried to simplify it as best I can. And I encourage you to take some time looking through this information, either on these slides or um, on the CDC website. But you can see in the first column, we're talking about the age. Remember we talked about your age when you first get your vaccine is important. CDC and the, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration um, and the Advisory Committee on uh, Immunization Practices Six months is the youngest age at which an infant can receive uh, the COVID vaccine, all the way on up through elderly adults. So six months and above are the ages. And you can see what the different vaccines are there in the column that says first dose. You can see what the different vaccines are that are available to people in those age groups. Um, as you get older, there are more vaccine options available to you. And then in under the second and third dose columns, how long you need to wait between doses um, from the first dose to the second dose. And then finally, in the last column, whether or not a booster dose is recommended based on your age and based on the vaccine that you've received. Now, there's a couple points that I'd like to hit home as well. Uh, one is that for the primary series of vaccines, 
CDC does not recommend mixing products for primary series doses. So if your first dose is, for example, with Moderna, then all of your primary doses should be uh, Moderna. Um, by contrast, if it's the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine um, or the Novavax vaccine, all of your primary series doses should be with that same vaccine. We also recommend that the um, you can see in that column under where it says second dose, there is a variation in when a person should receive their second dose, somewhat dependent upon what their underlying health status is, um, but also dependent um, on their age. And we know that for um, especially males between the ages of 12 and 39, we may want to, your healthcare provider may want to extend to the um, to that outer length, that eight weeks period of time to get the second dose um, because of the potential risk for um, heart inflammation, inflammation of the tissues around the heart, myocarditis, pericarditis. And so there is some recommendation, there's some thought there um, that extending it, especially for males between the ages of 12 and 39 um, to extend that period of time. On the other hand, um, if you, and we'll talk about this more on, the, on one of the later slides, depending on your underlying health condition, um, if you're immunocompromised, you may want to err on the side of getting your booster, your second dose rather, not the booster dose, but your second dose a little bit sooner. The other thing that I'd like to make a point of is that, um, as you can see in the bottommost row for people who are 12 to 17 years of age, the recommendation is that the booster um, be the updated, the bivalent Pfizer BioNTech booster only. This next slide, essentially similar information to what was on the previous slide, only now we're looking at two other age groups for people who are older than 18 years um, and people who are older than 65 years. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, other than to say that the booster dose, once you turn 18 years, the booster dose uh, could be either Moderna or the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. And then on this third slide, uh, the third table that I'm going to share with you today, what I'd really like for you to focus on is the bottom row where the category is more likely to get very sick from COVID-19. As we know, people with chronic kidney disease, people who have had organ transplants, as well as all the other conditions that we uh, shared on the earlier slide, this is really the category of people that um, we're talking about and that I'm, I'm addressing today. And you can see there that the uh, that range of dates for the second dose in the primary series is now been reduced to the lower end because we want people to make we want to make sure that people are adequately protected as well as getting the their booster doses in an appropriate period of time. Then the last thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is the uh, administration of some a drug um, called Evusheld. Evusheld are uh, something called monoclonal antibodies against the virus that causes COVID-19. And it's recommended for pre-exposure prophylaxis in people 12 years of age and older who are moderately or severely immunocompromised in order to help protect them. It's, a, it's an additional layer of protection for that subset, that category of people who might be at risk for infection. So now let's talk a little bit about international travel and uh, COVID-19. This slide and the next slide are some basic questions that people might have um, about international travel. Although I will say that many of these recommendations also apply to domestic travel. And so although my focus today is on international travel, uh, if you go to the CDC website and you look up information on domestic travel, many of this guidance applies to both categories. But I encourage you to, to go and, and check the website uh, if you have specific questions about domestic travel as well. So the first question, can I travel if I am sick with or tested positive for COVID-19 and am recommended to isolate? The CDC's recommendation is that if you are sick with or tested positive for COVID-19, that you stay home for at least 
five days and to follow all CDC's isolation recommendations. And that really means making sure that you stay away from others, um, that you do not share your bathroom, that you do not share uh, eating utensils or towels or blankets, bedding, that sort of thing, and that you do not travel because you really want to make sure that you are protecting uh, not only yourself, but protecting others um, from onward transmission of the virus. Let's say, though, you've ended your period of isolation, you've, you've followed the CDC recommendations to isolate, um, but the guidance is that you continue to wear your mask per CDC uh, recommendations, per CDC guidance. We recommend that if you are going to travel, that you wear a high quality mask or respirator the entire time you are around others indoors. Um, so whether that's in the uh, airplane or the bus that is going to be taking you to where it is that you need to go. And that if you cannot wear a high quality mask or respirator, that you do not travel by public transportation, that you really um, restrict yourself to private transportation if that's possible for you to get from your home to your final destination. And now for the third question, can I travel if I was exposed to someone with COVID-19 in the past 10 days? Our guidance, our recommendation is that you follow the CDC guidance, including getting tested at least five full days after your last exposure to that person that you know had COVID-19, that you wear a high quality mask or a respirator the entire time you're around others indoors, and that if you can't wear that high quality mask or respirator, that you don't travel by public transportation. And I've included on this slide a couple of links. Uh, one is to information about high quality masks so that you can get more details on that topic as well as wearing masks in travel and public transportation settings uh, so that you can do that planning ahead uh, for, your, for your travel. You've made your plans, you're thinking about leaving the United States, you're, you're getting ready, you're getting excited about the possibility of finally uh, traveling again, but there's some things that you really need to think about before you leave the United States. The most important thing that you can do is plan ahead for COVID-19. And that includes talking to your doctor, your healthcare provider, your healthcare team. Is now the right time for you to be traveling based on what we know about COVID-19 and what we know about what your healthcare team knows about your condition? Is it safe for you to be traveling at this point in time? Also, you want to use this as an opportunity to make sure that you're up to date with your vaccines. As we had mentioned before, being up to date means not only your primary series, but any recommended boosters based on your age, your underlying health condition, uh, and some of those other criteria that we had talked about earlier. You also want to research the current situation, the current COVID-19 situation at your destination. Are you planning on travel to someplace where the COVID-19 situation is fairly quiet at this point? Or is it possible that you might be thinking about going someplace where COVID-19 is very high, is, is, is quite uh, elevated and your risk of going to, into that situation might be greater? You also need to make sure that you're capable of and able to follow all the requirements of the transportation operator. So does your airline, does your cruise line, does your bus line, do they have specific requirements that you need to follow in order to make sure they want to make sure that their passengers and that their employees are safe? They may have specific guidelines for you to follow. Are you able to follow them is an important question that you need to address yourself as well as with your, uh, your healthcare team. In addition, your destination itself may have specific requirements. And so you might need to do certain things before you arrive, after you get there. Um, are you able to do all of those things? And you really want to take a multi-layered approach to protecting yourself. So that includes not only the vaccines, that includes not only masking, um, but there are several other uh, recommendations in terms of how you might want to be in a place where there is maximal um, ventilation, 
or there are other approaches to making sure that you're protected while you're traveling. For example, not being in places where um, there are large crowds, where people are very close to one another in an environment. That's something else that you're going to want to make sure that you're able to um, do in order to protect yourself. We also make the recommendation that you get tested before you leave uh, the United States, and that's within three days of your departure. And again, we recommend that you not travel if your test is positive in order to help safeguard against forward spread of the virus to others during your period of time that you're traveling. Now, one of the things that I mentioned in the previous slide is finding out perhaps what is the level of COVID-19 at your destination. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. One of the ways is by checking the current situation on one of these various websites that I have listed here. Um, the WHO has a coronavirus dashboard with the link provided. Um, the Johns Hopkins University has a similar dashboard where you can look for your destination and see what's going on in terms of the COVID-19 levels. Our World in Data is another good source for information. And then finally, the U.S. Department of State, the Bureau of Consular Affairs, you can link to a variety of um, destinations that will provide you with um, the information about um, the country where you're planning on visiting and they will give you information about not only about what the level is but what the requirements are for Americans who are arriving at those destinations in order to comply with the some of those requirements that I said uh, different destinations might have. During travel Obviously, you're going to want to continue to take protections um, and precautions so that you don't become sick while you're away. During travel, you want to make sure that you are taking steps to not only protect yourself, but also others. And there's a, several recommendations that the CDC has uh, in order to do so. One is to, as we had talked about earlier, you want to make sure that you wear masks in travel and public transportation settings. So that includes not only airplanes, trains, buses, but also the terminals where you may be catching those, um, those flights or those, um, those trains. You wanna make sure that you are um, masked in those environments. And then also to make sure that you follow the guidance, which includes both the recommendations and the requirements at your destination. If you don't, it's possible that you could be denied entry or required to return to the United States. And so you want to make sure that if there are requirements for uh, you to wear a mask, maybe even outside of um, travel and public transportation settings, um, if there's a requirement for you to prove that you've been vaccinated against COVID-19 or prove that you have a negative test for COVID-19, that's information that you can get, as I showed in the earlier slide from the U.S. Department of State website they will provide you with that information so that you will know how best to um, make it into the your destination uh, safely and be um, permitted entry uh, while you're there. One of the subcategories of travel um, is cruise ship travel. And we know that COVID-19 or the virus that causes COVID-19 spreads easily between people on board ships, and that includes both passengers and crew. Maybe even more easily than some of the other forms of conveyance. Um, and so it's for people who uh, have chronic kidney disease or people who are immunocompromised due to kidney transplantation, you really want to talk to your healthcare provider, your healthcare team about risks and precautions that are part of cruise ship travel. The other thing that's important, and I don't think we had mentioned this earlier, but if you are immunocompromised, it's possible that you're not even fully protected, even if you are up to date with your COVID-19 vaccine. So that's something to consider as well. And then finally, you wanna check with your cruise line about their testing and or vaccination protocols. They may have requirements themselves. And so getting tested before and after travel is really crucially important. And you can see a link there on this slide for more information about cruise travel during COVID-19 on the CDC website. So you've gone, 
you've successfully traveled, you had a, a, a good visit, you had a good time away, and now you're preparing to return to the United States. What advice does CDC have for you? Well, CDC has some requirements and also some recommendations. For all passengers, it's a requirement to provide contact information to airlines before boarding. So, so that in the event uh, someone on the plane is um, identified upon return or upon entering the United States to be ill with COVID-19, that way the CDC can capture that information from the airline and reach out to and uh, make sure that people who, other people who are on that airplane get the information that they need, that they were potentially exposed to somebody with COVID-19 and they can take the the proper quarantine precautions for themselves. We're not saying that necessarily you will get COVID-19, but we certainly want to make sure that uh, you're aware of the fact that you were potentially exposed and that you take the proper precautions. We also have recommendations that you get tested before you leave the country, uh, the country that you're coming from. Um, and again, just as we had recommended that you not travel away from the United States if your test is positive, you want to make sure you want, we certainly recommend that you not travel back on the airplane um, if your test is positive. And so thinking about, or and this sort of ties into that planning ahead, you need to make sure that you make arrangements for what you would do in the event that your tests were positive and that you would have to stay uh, in that country for some additional period of time until you were considered to be uh, allowed to travel again. Now, after you've arrived to the United States, we have some additional recommendations for you. After you've arrived back to the United States, we again recommend that you get tested three to five days after arrival, that you monitor yourself for any symptoms of COVID-19, and Here's some additional guidance if you know that you were exposed to someone with COVID-19, whether that was somebody um, at the destination or if you find out from the CDC that there was somebody perhaps on board the plane with you. Um, we want you to start precautions immediately and that includes wearing a mask. We want you to continue precautions for a full 10 days, so continue wearing a mask during that time. Get tested at least five full days after your last exposure. So. Was it somebody on the plane with you? Was it somebody that you had um, interacted with before you left your that country where you were visiting? Get tested at least five full days. And that if you test positive, you should isolate yourself immediately. We also want you to follow the recommendations and requirements of state, tribal, local, and territories where you are back in the United States. They may have additional, more restrictive guidance than the federal guidance, and it's important that you follow uh, their recommendations and requirements as well. And that has to do with whether it's wearing a mask or isolating, um, you wanna make sure that you're up to date and you're following that. Now, if you do test positive for COVID-19 after you've come back from your travel, we want you to stay home for at least five days isolating yourself from others at home. Um, and that's that five day period of time. Um, I don't think I mentioned that before, but you're most likely to be infectious during those first five days. And so that's why that five day period of time is, is critically important. As mentioned, I think I did mention before, you wanna use a separate bathroom as possible. You wanna improve ventilation in your home as much as possible. And you don't wanna share any personal household items, whether that is eating utensils or bedding or um, towels, that sort of thing. You wanna make sure that all of that is kept separately and that it is clean, washed under appropriate uh, sanitary procedures to make sure that you don't share that virus uh, with others. You wanna wear a high quality mask if you must be around others, whether that's at home or in public. Um, and you don't wanna to go to places where you cannot wear a mask. And of course, you really want to avoid traveling. These last couple of slides, I wanna talk about ending isolation if you test positive for COVID-19. What I really wanna focus on is um, this last slide here, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to move to the, the next slide in, it's the, uh, the last slide in the series here. And I want you to look at the very last row. Again, if you are moderately or severely immunocompromised, 
regardless of the COVID-19 symptoms or severity. So even if you're not that sick, um, we know that people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised can shed the virus for more than the five to 10 day period of time um, that is uh, characteristic of people who are not moderately or severely immunocompromised. So if you are a kidney transplant recipient and you are on those immunosuppressive drugs to prevent rejection, um, you're going to continue your isolation for a much longer period of time. And you will end your isolation really only after consultation with your healthcare team and infectious diseases specialist to make sure that you are not um, at risk of sharing the virus or spreading the virus to others who, um, who could then become infected. And you can see the link there at the bottom of the slide on ending isolation and precautions for people with COVID-19. So this is the last slide in my deck. Um, it is the CDC main page for the coronavirus COVID-19 uh, web pages. And you can find all of the information that I've talked about uh, in today's presentation on the CDC website. If you go to this link, there are many, many pages there. Um, and uh, it's searchable, so you can find the information that you need. Um, you can find information, as I said, uh, I think at the outset, you can find information on international travel. You can find information on domestic travel. You can find information on vaccines. You can find information on how to protect yourself and others. And it's really a wealth of information. The other reason why I think it's really important that you bookmark this page is because the information that I provided to you today is current as of today. But as you know, things are changing and they are continuing to change with the COVID-19 pandemic. They are continuing to change on a fairly regular and rapid basis. There's lots of new information that's coming out, lots of new guidance with regard to vaccines and how to protect yourself and others. So the information that I've shared with you today is current as of today, but over the course of these next weeks and months, uh, that information is, I think, quite likely to change. And so you wanna make sure that you are as current as possible uh, before you plan that trip, before you uh, make arrangements for going to visit others, you want to make sure that you know the latest information that's available from the CDC website. So I want to thank you all for your time and your attention today. Uh, I hope that this has given you um, a high level overview of COVID-19 and international travel and the, the current guidance current recommendations for people who are traveling internationally. Um, and uh, I wish you all uh, a good, safe voyage, a bon voyage, and um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nemhauser, for an important update on how kidney patients can continue to practice safety measures while traveling. I'd like to close today's webinar with a few slides on additional resources that may be of interest to you. If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, you can join online or by phone. And in order to receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life, we also invite you to follow us on our blog and social media for all the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients and un patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers. 
by visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP Store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. And you can also order materials by phone. AAKP holds a number of events throughout the year, and these events are live streamed and recorded. Please visit our YouTube channel to watch presentations from our 2022 events, including our Global Innovation Summit with George Washington University, our National Patient Meeting, and our Policy Summit. For more patient resources on COVID-19 and to listen on demand to any of the previous webinars AAKP has hosted regarding COVID-19 with our strategic partners like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, please visit the Coronavirus Resource page on the AAKP website, which you can ac access from the red COVID-19 information button on our homepage. We'd again like to thank Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser for sharing with us important information to consider about COVID-19 and traveling safely. If you have any questions about what you heard on today's webinar, please send them to info at aakp.org and we will work to respond to all questions regarding this webinar. Thank you again for joining us today. Be informed and stay safe.